Welcome to episode one of the BDS podcast. I am your host, Rose Griffin, and I had an amazing conversation today with Terry Adams and Dr. Kim Kelly. Terry started out determined to find a career outside of behavior analysis. She pursued an undergraduate degree in agricultural education. Following her undergrad work, Terry had a change of heart and enrolled in the ABA program at the Pennsylvania State University, Harrisburg. And while working on her graduate work and practicum hours, Terry gained experience working with autistic learners. She started at BDS in 2014 and has worked on the CBA Learning Module Series, the RBT Exam Prep Course, the RBT 40-Hour Training Course, CE Courses, and much more much more. Dr. Kim Kelly is a PhD BCBA and is a senior behavior analyst at Behavior Development Solutions, where she develops test prep materials for the national certification exam for BCBAs and RBTs, curriculum supplements for universities, continuing education courses, and university courses in behavior analysis. She served as adjunct faculty for the Antioch New England Graduate Program in ABA for 11 years and is the past president of the New Hampshire Association of Behavior Analysis. Prior to this, Dr. Kelly, along with colleagues, founded a multi-state nonprofit human services organization where she spent nearly 40 years developing and overseeing community residential and day services for children and adults with intellectual and other disabilities. We have an amazing chat today. We talk all about how BDS started, which was very, very interesting. We talked about how the content is derived. We talk about the importance of active student responding, and so much more. I'm excited for us to start this first episode of the BDS Podcast. You're listening to the BDS Podcast by Behavior Development Solutions, online at bds.com. Your source for evidence-based training in applied behavior analysis since 1998. From premier curriculum supplement and exam prep to RBT training and continuing education, including live webinars and more. Thanks so much for joining us on episode one of the BDS podcast. I am your host, Rose Griffin, and we have a great show for you today. We have with us Dr. Kim Kelly and Terry Adams. Thank you so much for joining us. It's amazing to have you on. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Kicking us off with episode one, I'm very excited about this. BDS is definitely something that's near and dear to my heart, and I've done webinars for BDS, and also I utilize the modules, you know, to pass the test for the first time. So it's exciting to be here and talking with both of you today. Um, Can you each tell us a little bit about you and your journey into the field? Um, I can go first. So I, my name is Terry Adams. Um, I was raised by Stephen Eversole. That's my dad. Um, So when I went to college, I got an undergrad degree in education. And then I graduated and I was like, you know what? As much as I resisted that whole ABA thing, I think I do want to learn more about ABA. Um, So then I went and got my master's in ABA and got certified. Thank goodness. I was really afraid to take that test uh, after using the modules because there was a lot of pressure. But thank goodness I passed on the first time (laughs) after using my modules to 100%. um, And then I eventually made my way into BDS. Amazing. Very cool. And hi, I'm Kim Kelly. Um, My journey is a little bit longer and more meandering than Terry's. Um, I have been with BDS for the past, I guess it'll be six years um, this summer. But I started out in the field of, um, well, I started in the very, very, very beginning in the field of art. But we'll skip that part and we'll move to juvenile corrections. And where I learned really rapidly how much the environment impacted people's behavior and how logical their behavior was given the environment. And I meandered through several courses at the University of Minnesota and landed on a course with Kathy Lord on autism. And that sort of took me down the path of working uh, with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and autistic people, 
which I pursued for many, many decades, starting a nonprofit in Vermont with my spouse and two other folks. So we ran that for many, many decades. And then when I found myself switching careers, I had uh, always had an interest in instructional design. I too had lived and died by the modules because I probably also <laughs> would have been really nervous to have not passed that test. <laughs> and so I um, saw an opening at BDS and decided I was going to sort of make a career change sort of later in life. I had also taught at Antioch University, a BA program for 11 years. So the science of learning was always near and dear to my heart. And uh, that's how I ended up here. Oh, amazing. So you also use the modules to to prepare for the exam? Oh, yes. And of course, it was it was a long, long time ago. But I remember going, oh, my goodness, after all these years out of school, I have to take a really important test. And so it was very exciting to find them. And yeah. I I drilled through those modules. I know we have people who say, oh, I have to do. Oh, my goodness, I missed one. Oh, I must have gone through them like 10 times. <laughs> Just make same. Sure. <laughs> okay, same. Yes, I didn't have to use them as part of my coursework, but I use them to prepare for the exam. And I had, I think I gave myself three months. I had a really rigorous study schedule and it was all about the Cooper book and the BDS modules. And that was, yep. that was yep. how I did it, you know. <laughs> okay, interesting. I love to hear everybody's kind of story there. So thanks so much for sharing. Um, my next question, I'm sure we all have this as kind of like a burning question, is can you tell me a little bit about how BDS got started? And we pass that to Dan. <laughs> I was at the very first conference where we sold the modules on the desk. I was lying. <laughs> um, but BDS basically got started. Um, my my dad um, got his PhD in education and had learned from Guy Bruce um, and, and Jack Michael and wanted to use what he had learned um, to help. He wanted to use computer programming to utilize active responding and immediate feedback to help people pass the exam. Um, and I remember him telling me when I was young that he had always talked about, you know, using behavior analysis to save the world and how he was going to, he was going to do that. And he said the best he could figure out was to train other behavior analysts. Um, so by, by helping people pass the exam, he was helping other people become certified and go out in the field and do good work. Um, so that is also part of what he still believes and um, also why we try to be the premier uh, test prep. It's not just passing the exam, it's being the best behavior analyst you can be. Oh, I love that. And I love that it started <laughs> out on a disc because that's actually how... A CD. Okay, that's how Netflix started. I remember I got Netflix for my husband 20-some yeah. years ago, and we used to have a queue, and we used to say what movies we wanted to watch. We'd go down to our little apartment mailbox, and we would get it, and it was so exciting. But it's been amazing to be a customer of something like that and just to see the growth. So I think that it just as a small business owner, it's really fun to just hear about that first conference that you went to when you were nine, how your dad just had a vision of, of helping others and how it really started so organically with this mission to help other people also become BCBAs. That's really inspiring. I love that. Very cool. Um, so now let's go ahead. I was just going to say, I think the very first version was just content area six, which was like the huge bulk of the task at the time task list. Um, so it, it started off as just a portion of the task list too. Oh, we finally got this task list all done. And then we finally got online. That was a, another huge milestone that we were really excited to meet. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I love that so much. So let's talk a little bit about, can you tell us how the content is derived? Sure, I'll, I'll step in and then Terry can uh, add things. Uh, Obviously, because it is an exam prep, we follow closely either the task list, which is now the test content outlined by the BACB. Uh, and um, although that sounds really good, you can see that it's only several pages and, and we have currently now close to 4,000 questions. So it's a guide. It's just a general guide. And then we tend to use two um, resources, um, obviously the Cooper book. Um, and uh, the other one is BELK or Behavior Analysis for Lasting Change as sort of a guide to the general content. And we do that in particular because most people have 
those books or use those books in their graduate programs. Mm -hmm. It's important to us that people are able to look up and study further and and, um, be able to expand their knowledge. And if we use too many obscure uh, kinds of material, they would never be able to find it. And also those are, as we said, the books that most often people are learning from, in addition to some other great books. I don't I don't want to demean the other books because there's some other fine books on behavior analysis. So we do that. We also look at, um, you know, other specific resources of uh, people in the field who are experts in particular content area. And that has changed more over time. So, for example, if you look at supervision, We've had various versions of supervision over time with people who have different skills and different kinds of supervision. And so we will use specific textbooks in some areas of very unique expertise. Um, And then we would analyze the content to that um, and uh, get an overview, do an outline of what kind of concepts and principles we need to cover around one of those task list items or test content outline now. And we would then develop concepts around those and analyze the concepts we need to do and then start um, framing out our learning frames on that. That's sort of a very general. I know we'll get into more of the details. Terry, did I miss anything? Um, Oh, the one other thing is we use Bloom's taxonomy or Tiemann and Markle has a very similar taxonomy. And that helps us design question content around different levels of complexity and difficulty so that we cover not just basic definitional questions, but examples and non-examples, applied questions, critique and analyze questions, so that we kind of cover the breadth of ways that people should be able to access this knowledge. That's wonderful. So it's good to know. It sounds like a lot of work that's going into into the beat. I'm just thinking like, because I've met different members of your team too. So does everybody have their own? Because it seems like such a tiered process for, you know, consuming all of the potential content, then breaking it down into this idea or these learning frames, and then coming up with the actual questions that are going to be part of the, you said over 4,000 questions that could possibly be within the modules. Yes, at this point, um, you know, and it's changing because, of course, we're preparing for TC06. Um, the release of that probably in the summer or fall, and it is all designed around, um, you know, the test prep, but we also have other content in it because, as Terry had commented, is just being well-trained behavior analysts is really important to all of us and certainly to Steve. And so there are certain content areas. Now the new test content outline is not designed around the same kinds of ideas. So a lot of the content um, is not going to be quite the same because we have new emphasis in the field and we have to sort of um, you know, meet those requirements to make sure people can pass the exam. That's amazing. So could you talk to us a little bit about that idea of the 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 content analysis or the concept analysis, how, we, you know, with the BDS modules, and I think, too, with the tests, why people are fear, fearful of the test. It's not just a black and white. When you look at a question, there could be many possible potential answers. I know that that's what always made me so fearful. And I feel like, and I don't know off the top of my head what how many people passed the test initially the first time, but I feel like when I took it, um, almost over 10 years ago, there was a, a small percentage of people that were actually passing it. They had just made the test harder is what they had said a long time ago. I was like, oh, goody, this is so fun. Oh, yay for me. Um, but can you talk to us a little bit about those ideas and how how you build that into the modules? Sure, I can just jump in with the test. It's usually hovering around 65, you know, give or take per year pass. Okay. And then, of course, with the modules, our last set of data was 98.1% of people pass on the first time if they've completed all the modules to 100% within six months of taking the exam. And that's really important. You can't take it and then several years later sit for the exam and wonder why you can't remember. So I just needed to add that in. So I don't know, Terry, if you want to jump in because I've been chatting a lot. Um, well, I was um, you, to answer your question. We are skipping ahead a little bit, but um, we so the content analysis and the concept analysis. We we do a thorough kind of breakdown to make sure that we've covered. Kim Kim talked on this, but we cover definitions and up through applying and critiquing scenarios. Um, but we also use close in examples and non examples that sound very similar. Um, people like to say that we're tricking them. Uh, we're not. We're not trying to be mean. We're not trying to be tricky. 
we're trying to make sure that you read very carefully um, and and make sure that you're choosing the best correct answer. And that's something I tell people at conferences all the time. There's correct answers and then there's the best correct answer. And, and that's what you need to figure out. And I think that's an important thing that our modules teach that really help test takers. And as Terry had said, uh, you know, when we do the concepts, I mean, a concept typically has a variety of critical features about it. So think of positive reinforcement. Certain things and features make it positive reinforcement. And so when we vary them and make our close-in examples and non-examples, we would vary one of those features. And that's why it looks really close. So if you say positive reinforcement, you know, is upon the occurrence of a behavior, there is an event, and that event serves to increase the probability of behavior. If you change one of those things, it makes it not positive reinforcement. In fact, it would make it probably one of the other types of negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. But it is that building that discrimination, which is what people need to be able to do, but it looks like we're trying to trick you. So we deliver the reinforcer before the behavior. Oh, they're just trying to trick me. No, it's really important to know when the delivery of the reinforcer occurs. And that is one of the critical features of positive reinforcement. So um, the idea that we're trying to trick you, I, I, I do appreciate it. Um, but we are mostly trying to trick you into reading the question. That's what we're trying to trick you into doing. Because <laughs> often people will just... Question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say reading the question and all of the options. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, is to, is to really be careful because you can so often when we get question comments from people, they haven't read both, both of those things. They haven't read the question or they haven't read all the options. And, um, and that's why they're making an error. And that also prepares you for the test because uh, that's the same way it's going to be on a test. You have to read it all. Yeah. And I think that's too, just with people's attention spans now, this might just is completely opinion. But I mean, we're so, things are so quick. We're scrolling on social media. We're not taking the time to just be fully present. I talk about this a lot in therapy, just to be really present with your student and your learner. So it makes a lot of sense. It's just like you're teaching people to to really be present, to take in all of the information. And just as an aside, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was telling that what I took the BCBA exam, I didn't find out right away if I had passed or didn't pass. I'm like, this is like showing how long I've been certified over 10 years now, because I just went to the study center. I, you know, looked over my book and everything before, got in there, locked up all my belongings, did the test, you know, and then it was just, I had to wait. I mean, you had yes. to wait a long time. And I don't remember if I had to pay extra to find out ahead of time, or maybe that was the speech test, but... I just remember being extremely anxious, anxious because now you find out immediately. Is that correct? If you've passed it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and back in the day. Experiences you. I was okay. back in the day and I accidentally found out over a month after I'd taken the test because I was at a track meet and an email came up to all certificates. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. That might mean I passed and then found the big envelope because, of course, oh. we got to find the big envelope. The little envelope <laughs> meant you didn't pass. The big envelope was the certificate. So, Oh, wow. Um, I know. See, we, we're going to carry this trauma with us. I know, right? <laughs> big envelope is good. <laughs> okay. Small envelope's not good. <laughs> yes, it is good. It's fun to talk about those things, just how the field has changed. And, you know, the company, right. the field, the test-taking experience, I just, it's fun to talk and reminisce about that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the active student responding, because that is definitely active student responding is a key feature of the modules. Can you tell us more about that and why it is so very very important. Do you can start? Sure. Um, so active student responding is so important because it requires the learner to read, <laughs> think about it, and actually respond. Um, and that is a, that response is a key feature in learning, a key feature of the modules that um, facilitates learning. And I, I'm going to add to that the immediate feedback after the response is also very important. Um, but it's, um, I we used to be told back in the day that that is what really separates us from 
um, some of the other exam prep. And I think it's a little different these days. There's a lot more competition that includes active student responding with the as internet-based learning and apps are more available. But that used to be that used to be what made us different and used to be what made us fun, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> some of the early users said it was fun because they they would get excited to read and answer and and find out right away if they answered correctly um, and move through the modules that way. Um, I think you're seeing more and more student responding in, in multimedia presentation, like continuing ed type yeah. learning, especially online. And I think that's such a great way to keep people engaged, um, but also just the, the process of selecting the answer um, is so important. Um, Kim, do you want to Oh, um, yeah, no, you covered it yeah. pretty much. It's, you know, you have to do something with the information. And and all of us have ha sat through passively in lectures. And I actually train myself to sort of engage in active responding as I go through it. Because if you don't, it's so easy to think. Have you ever been to a lecture and thought, I would understand that. And two days later, you're like, I have no idea what they were talking about. And I don't know how to apply it because you didn't engage and sort of practice with the material there was a lot of work in psychology around the testing effect where um, people I talked about even taking a test, you learn after taking your test, and it really is that component of active responding. So I'm sure you've taken a test, you tried to respond to something, you thought you knew the material, you got out of the test and beelined home to look at your book to figure out if you had actually answered it correctly. So it's not just, um, just responding, I think responding and manipulating information. So, for example, in a lot of the new authoring tools for online, you might use flip cards or some things like that, but you have to really manipulate the information. You have to be able to respond and think about the information. And, of course, as Skinner noted, it could be covert as much as overt. Overt responding allows us to check your answer. So um, it's always better in a sense because you can get what Terry just pointed out. You can get feedback that you had actually uh, thought about that principle or concept and an answered correctly. So it is really, I actually um, love anything that allows me to give a, a chance to respond because it so quickly reshapes your thinking around a concept because you know right away that I've, you know, I've missed something, I've misunderstood something, and then you can reformulate versus finding out later you haven't quite grasped something. And learning is hard. If people say this is hard, learning's hard. And there's just no way around it. And good learners are learners who persevere, who go through until they understand something, who look up different resources till they can figure out something. And this is a mechanism that really is helpful in doing that. Yeah, I think that's great about the modules as well. And I too have seen that as I present a lot. And so I always try to include that active student responding piece. And I know other places I've done trainings for will have a poll and they use special software to make sure that everybody is engaged <laughs> and things like that. So, but I do think also when I'm at conferences and I have a chance to respond or it's more active that you do learn because I think you're just thinking about the material on a deeper level. So that's that's good to know that you also like that during trainings because I, I do a lot of virtual presentations. So I make people, you know, answer in the chat and, you know, come back and there's so many ways to be distracted in this world with anything online. Uh, we spend a lot of our lives online. So I think it's a good way just to kind of rein in all of our attention and make sure that we're really analyzing the information, really understanding the concepts, because I like the idea of it's we're not just you didn't it's this wasn't created just so we could pass the test. This was created so we could really learn. And it's more of a transformative, more transformative experience, because when we get into the field, that's just you know, we're just dipping a toe into what is ABA and how we can use it to help other people. So this is such a, a nice way uh, to start things. So on to my next question, which I'm sure that a lot of people have this same question, is uh, do you make the modules hard on purpose? Uh, I think we already touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to repeat, no, we don't do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Although sometimes we do giggle to ourselves as we're writing these questions. Um, we touched a little bit on close in examples um, and how we we are trying to teach find discrimination. So that's why some of the options look so very similar and you have to read carefully to find the best correct option. Um, I'm also going to use this opportunity to remind everyone to read the hints 
um, when we were talking about active student responding a minute ago, I thought of the fact that, you know, you're, you also, we also tried to make it errorless. I understand that it's not totally errorless. Um, and that's why there's, that's why you go through the modules over and over again until it is errorless. But every time you make an error, that's an opportunity to remember the wrong answer the next time. So we tried to make it as errorless as possible. Um, that's why the hints are there. That's why we encourage you to use the hints and read the hints. And even more so than the hints, I think our best feature is the review incorrects. When you get to the end of your module, there's an option to review all the incorrects and you can see all in one place, all in one screen, you can see the question, the correct options, the one you selected, the one that you should have selected and the hint. So I know when I was a user, there was some times where I thought I thought I really had the correct answer. And when I could see the hint on the same screen as the correct answer, I could put it together a little better um, at the end. So review, use your hints, review your incorrects every time, read them carefully. And we don't make them hard on purpose. And we love you. <laughs> a few yeah. plugging away. And this is for this is for your own good. Um, yes. So so this is for your own good. Yes. So if there's somebody out there listening and they haven't used the modules and they're unfamiliar with them, because honestly, I haven't been on there in a while. Um, so you have the question, and then is the hint under the question, and you can utilize the hints before answering the question, or how does? I'm just asking because I, you know, if somebody's listening and they haven't been on the modules, what, how does that exactly work? Because I can't remember. The hint is a button on the screen. So you have to click on the hint and open it up. And I believe it covers the answers and you can't move it so that you can read the answers in the hint at the same time. Okay. This has been a debate in many a, um, many a meeting. <laughs> okay. um, but Stephen ultimately has the final say and that's how he wants it. Okay. Uh, that's, but that is why you review your incorrects. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, you click the hint button, you read the hint, and, and then you should be able to select, once you close your hint, you should be able to select the correct answer. Or if you don't, you review your incorrects at the end. Okay. Okay. So then at the end of that particular section, you can go back and review all of the maybe ones that you got incorrect and they also have the hint listed in that area all in one place. Yeah. So at the end of the module on your summary screen, there's a button that you can click to review the incorrects and it takes you, it's one question frame per screen and you can, you can see everything on the screen in front of you and read through it. And then you can click to the next question that you got wrong. It's only the ones that you've answered incorrectly in that module. Oh, Okay. Okay, good to know. It's good to just build a visual of exactly what that looks like. Yeah, it seems like a cohesive way then to go back and say like, okay, these are areas that I need to touch on. This is definitely an area I need to work on um, and things like that. So that's that's good. Thank you for thank you for answering um, that. On to my my. Can next. I add something yeah, to that absolutely. just quickly? Because it's it is as important that um, we do a lot of analysis of the data. As you can imagine, thousands of people take this. And so when you talk about making it hard on purpose, we have what we call a CQI process, a continual quality improvement process. And we analyze all the user's data to look at which answer they're choosing and on every question. And then we look at, mm, you know, is there some confusion in how the question's written? Do we need, uh, you know, a, a supportive question because we haven't defined this well enough? So we spent actually a lot of time trying to make it, I don't want to say easier, but clear, maybe would be a better mm -hmm. word for it, is that we definitely are trying to get people to answer this correctly. Sometimes it's a struggle because, as Terry has pointed out, um, the resources that are available don't all, always get used. They don't read a hint. They don't, you know, maybe review incorrect. So that's why we keep plugging because it really helps. But we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure the material is as clear as possible and as supportive as possible. There aren't gaps in knowledge. And if there's an answer or an option, rather, that someone selects and it's um, very clear why the error is being made, we, we'll make it an adjustment to make sure that um, we're teaching better. It's all about good teaching. If they can't learn, we're not teaching well. I mean, isn't that the learner's always right, right? <laughs> so that's, what, that's how we approach the modules. 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. On the back end, just kind of analyzing. So if a lot of people are getting this particular question wrong, you're analyzing, well, why might that be? And it's hard too to know because on the user end, it's like, did they utilize the hint? Did they look at it? Did they read the question? So we can we can look yeah. at that. We can oh, figure that out. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you probably can't analyze if the hint has yeah. is yeah. being it's open. Open. Yeah. They review they're incorrect. So we can we can finally analyze what they did to try and answer that question. So, oh, that's really you know, if the hint was opened and how long it was open. Yeah, they <laughs> opened it and or opened it and read it. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> participant data. Yes, I have a, my own business too. So I, I know what you're saying. You can see like, did the person finish that course and how long did it take? Yeah, yeah. all yeah. those things that we need to do for providers. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Um, and here's another question. So do you know, do you know what is on the test? I'm sure a lot of people, that's a burning question for people as well. <laughs> that is a burning question. And no, we do not know what's on the test. We don't have access to the test. We are not BFFs with anybody at the BACB. Um, we used to always be, be next to the BACB booth back in the early, early days. Um, so that was also very confusing. People always thought we were somehow associated with them because mm -hmm. um, at conferences, we were often next to them. But no. We're, we don't have any tie-ins to the BACB or any secret information or any access to the test. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Thanks for clearing. <laughs> when I would imagine way back in the day when BDS started, I mean, the field has grown just so rapidly since I've just been certified, which is probably over 10 years. I'm sure there maybe weren't as many vendors. There weren't as many ABA conferences. Right now, you guys are everywhere. I think on Instagram, I saw the other day, it was like every, there, you were represented at three different conferences or something three like that. Right. And I'm sure, you know, back, especially when your dad was certified and things like that, it was just so very small. I, and I know I'm going to be talking to him too, but just how the field has really grown and just in number and things like yeah. that. So it's changed. Interesting. Yeah. Um, can you tell us how users can best utilize the product? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Terry's, Terry's <laughs> I, I think Terry has said a lot of this already, but it is, it is to take all the acquisition modules to 100%. Um, we have always recommended that people rotate through the modules versus what we call brute force. Take it, whoops, stop it, start over. Take it, oops, missed one, quit, start over. That that does not give you the repeated practice because everything's about repeated practice. We can also tell if you did that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so that a mass PDS have ever done that. No, Terry and I joke because that's the first confession I had to make to Steve is that I actually quit when I, uh, you know, I got to the end question 26 of 27 and I got it wrong <laughs> or, you know, something like that where I have been multiple times through a module, but I, I, I mostly did them all, but you, you should take all the questions. We talk about rotating so you're not just sort of memorizing them. If you, even on 25 questions, take it seven times, at some point, memorization is going to be occurring mm -hmm. just because that's how humans work. So we suggest that people rotate through modules, take it, review your incorrects, see what you did wrong, read hints if you haven't read them um, originally before you answered the question, then move on to another module and go through like four like that until you start mastering them. Once you master your acquisition, you move to your fluency. And so fluency in the BDS modules right now are the same questions. You get two minutes approximately. You get a very briefer time to finish them where you usually get an hour or so to finish an acquisition module. And by the time you hit fluency, you should be able to make it through those questions really rapidly. That's what fluency is, right? Effortless responding. You should be able to just do those because you have now learned the material. So people should definitely do that. And to 100%, um, you, you can't move on from acquisition to fluency without doing that. Uh, so you should, you should do it to, to, in order to accomplish that. But that's what is correlated with passing the test. Uh, Terry already talked about reviewing your incorrects. Um, there are also a lot of other reports that people never look at. Um, um, and back up one step and question comments. The question comments, if you answered something and said, wait a minute, I think that's wrong, which is what people will do to us a lot. <laughs> and send the question comment in and a real live breathing behavior analyst will get back to you. So it is it is a very personal response that you'll get about that. And we try as much as we can. We can't tutor you, but to explain 
why one option might be correct versus another. Um, and then there are other reports. There is course completion reports that you can um, take and you can look at where you are in all the modules, how long it took you. You can compare your mean, uh, we call them runs to criterion. So how many times you have to go through that module till you met the 100%. There are averages, like for example, most of our averages run to criteria or medians is what we usually report are um, under four. And part of our process is if people are taking four to six, we will look at that module and see if there's something wrong with the module. So you should take advantages of all those report and report options. We also have the mock exam. Um, people get two tries to the mock exam. And what we've just added, the new feature, is what to study. So based on your mock exam results, we can't give you the answers to the test. That'll invalidate our test. But we give you a list of um, concepts that you missed based on the question. And then there's a video on what to study or a review of the concept or a review of the definitions that will help you in your next go around prepare for uh, the uh, next mock exam or for the actual exam. And we also would direct you back to the modules, direct you pages in Cooper or Bulk, other reading materials. So we, we try to support all the way through the POS process, going through the modules, getting you through those, getting you through fluency, looking at all your reports, seeing where you're having trouble, mock exam, what to study based on the mock exam. We are really trying to get you through that test. <laughs> and Terry, you might want to add some things to that. I was just going to say, we do try to make the modules as user-friendly as possible. Um, we have a study scheduler feature, so you can um, put in your exam date and how many days a week you need to study. Like, let's say you need to prioritize studying three days a week. It'll tell you how long to spend, it, to spend on the modules, how many modules you need to complete on those days, or if you can study seven days a week. Um, so we have that in there that you can really in individualize your study schedule. Um, there is a search feature, so if there's a certain topic that you want to brush up on, that feature is available to search. You can type in extinction, positive reinforcement, uh, chaining, and it will give you a list of modules that cover that topic. Hmm. Um, and last but not least, all of this is discussed in our Strats for Success module, which is in the very beginning of the modules where we kind of break down and really show you how to best use the modules, how to set yourself up, not only for success, but for completion. I'm not really sure which order those should be in, but <laughs> to complete the modules so that you can pass. Um, and I'll just reiterate again, that the money back guarantee is dependent on you completing 100% of the modules within six months of your test date, which means you start and finish six months before your test date. <laughs> I, I love the idea of the scheduler because I don't think they had that probably a long time ago when I took the test because I I definitely, I had, yeah, I just made my own schedule and it was on paper and pencil, which, you know, I got a clipboard right here with all my questions. That's kind of how I still, I still do things. I mean, I use central reach like the rest of the world, but I do like my paper pencil data. Um, okay, that's interesting because I think that's really nice because I think it's hard for people to get their head around how long do you need to have to prepare? Because as you just listening to both of you talk about how much you are preparing to help us prepare as a field for this examination and then just, you know, to be better behavior analysts, it is it's not something that just happens overnight. And I think to yeah. really get in all this information to understand where maybe the holes in your learning or maybe some gaps in your supervision. I mean, we all have those areas where, yes, we feel comfortable. I mean, Kim, when you were talking about all the different types of reinforcement, I was going back to like looking at the Cooper book and the modules like, oh my goodness, I haven't thought about that concept in a while, right? I mean, you're in touch with some of this stuff uh, way more than I am if you're not practicing and doing it. So I think that scheduler alone is really Really nice because then you can kind of, for me, being very, I'm extremely type A, being both a speech therapist and a BCBA, but I liked and it gave me comfort to know like, okay, the, these are the tools that I'm going to utilize to to get ready for this test. And there's so much that people talk about the test and it scares you and you want to feel prepared. And what it really sounds like is you were just doing such a, a so much work to help us feel prepared that this is just a way, if we stick to the schedule, if we use these resources, then when we go into that testing center, we're going to feel confident. We're going to feel 
like we're ready. I'm laughing too, Kim, because when you said you you take the test and you go back and you look at your book to see if you got the right answer, um, I was totally that person because after I took my BCBA exam, I think I looked at my book more after I took the test because <laughs> I'm not like a crammer. I like I would get in ready in the morning. Yeah, I would like yeah. just look over everything because I'm like, if I don't know it now, nothing is going to help me, you know? So I take the test. And then after the test, I remember definitely spending some time with the Cooper book and saying like, OK, did I get that right? Or what was that question again? So that's interesting that there's research out there um, about that. Very, very cool. Such good information. Um, I feel like we've covered su- such important ground on this first episode of the BDS podcast. Um, is there anything else that either of you would like to share with our listeners? Kind of any last uh, last things to share? Um, if uh, I would just add, um, again, to use our question comment feature, there are many people, in fact, that just helped someone recently um, who was really struggling and uh, we can help you. We can help you generate reports if you don't know how and how to interpret them and to sort of target your learning. Obviously, when you go into an exam, you want to not just focus on the areas where you're struggling. You need to, you know, sort of keep your skills up in the other areas, but you might need to do some targeted learning. And I find that um, it is so voluminous. I mean, just looking at our task list and test content outline and the modules themselves, and you get a report back that says, study positive reinforcement, you know, it just seems overwhelming. So Mm -hmm. to help, we help people sort of break that down to what's the best way to help uh, fill those gaps in learning. Uh, And we've done some of it quite personally just to get people through it. Um, Like I said, we're not tutors, but we can help you analyze our data and structure your learning to to make it more efficient and effective for you. And Mm -hmm. Terry, did you have something? I'm sorry. Um, Mine was going to be similar. Just if you... um, We pride ourselves on customer service. We have a great customer service team. Um, One of one or two of them have been here for over 20 years. Um, So if there is a question that you have, feel free to ask. Um, We also, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of report features that aren't obvious. So if there's data that you're looking for, or if you want to know how you're doing, definitely reach out and um, and customer service can answer those questions actually better than the behavior analysts sometimes because they're much much more fluent on our platform. Uh, we <laughs> we focus on the content and the customer service. They know all the up, updates to the platform um, better than we do. So yeah. always reach out if you have a question. You're never bothering us. We're we're all over the U.S., so we're all sorts of time zones. <laughs> um, so just reach out and we're, we'll be happy to help. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was really great to meet both of you and I hope I'll see you soon. Terrific. Thank you so much. This was a great Bye. opportunity. Yes, thank you. For more information about BCBA exam prep and curriculum supplement, RBT training, CE courses, including live webinars and more, please visit bds.com. We know that learning is a lifestyle, not a destination, and we thank you for including us in your journey by listening to this episode of the BDS Podcast.